Why do card games or video games always seem to be surrounded by men? It doesn't take long to notice after being inside of a card shop or video game store that the dominant consumer seems to be men. Here's where things get weird. What if I told you that all this has been manufactured by a group of elite American executives since the 90s? Or that the US being in constant militarized conflict with the world shaped this phenomenon? Toys go boom. At the height of adolescent consumerism in the 90s, toys targeted towards girls such as Barbie and G.I. Joe targeted towards boys were a main staple in every department and toy store. Meanwhile, a Japanese media franchise by the name of Game Freak was beginning to take over the Japanese youth consumer market. However, marketing executives had different plans. Movement is, is it a craze? Is it a it's state a of It's a craze for little kids to enjoy themselves with. Adults are not going to get into this a lot. What was interesting is, for the last year. When it comes to the biggest Pokemon craze, it has to be the trading cards. This 747 arrived today from Tokyo, packed with the latest collectible cards. After the initial success of the Pokemon game series in Japan, Pokemon Red and Green, Nintendo branched out into other regions, predominantly the US. Soon thereafter, with a booming reception of game sales in retail toy stores, the Pokemon anime was aired a few months later, featuring a male protagonist, Ash Ketchum. I won't dive too deeply into the influences of having such a lead, but that does play a role in preventing women from relating to the franchise in the earlier years. Stupid travelers. That means uh, I'm stupid? Despite having Misty, who is Ash's companion in the show, as a supporting lead. I love my new little Pokemon. I guess it takes a worm to love a worm. Very funny. Not to mention the ability to choose to play as a girl in 2001, coming three years later. Another core pillar to note is that from the inception of Pokemon video games marketing, in the US at least, commercials heavily featured boys exclusively. And, as a matter of fact, any characterization of women or girls were portrayed as a nuisance. My sister, the Pokemon master. <laughs> Pikachu, let's play! This narrative was heavily pushed from 98 through 2003. It wasn't until the release of Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire that marketing executives in the United States tried to leverage more gender-inclusive marketing. However, this didn't inspire an increase in sales. From a high of 46 million copies for Red and Blue to a meek 21 million for Ruby and Sapphire, it was clear that Pokemon in their third generation of games was on a sinking ship of relevancy to its core audience, boys. It's here where I'd like to make a clear distinction between the US marketing of Pokemon in comparison to Japan's. From the very inception of Pokemon's mainstream release to the public, marketing-wise, I believe that marketing executives in Japan were aware that the franchise had universal appeal, whereas the US felt Pokemon appealed more to boys. Why American marketers felt this way will be explored a little later. The very first Japanese Pokemon commercial in fact featured a girl at the core of its narrative. From there on, the Pokemon company focused on the broadest appeal in their marketing efforts, in fact, to this very day. I'm not going to wonder why she's in heels and a really short dress. Uh, it was the 90s. Most commercials in Japan either featured both men and women, as well as various age groups. I don't want to explore the specific cultural difference between the East and the West side of the world when it comes down to market segmentation of their game messaging, but there is a relevant point here I would like to uncover. The influence of war <coughs> of war on cultural messaging. Conflict nation versus peace nation. See, unlike the US, Japan after World War II experienced a very long period of peace, which I believe shaped their cultural ideas around games and activities as a whole. Whereas the US, shortly after World War II, experienced a very long and drawn out period of conflict with several nations. So hear me out. You have baby boomers who were raised by the silent generation of World War II that grew up during a prolonged period of Cold War messaging, who then came of age and experienced a draft mandate in the 70s for another war in Vietnam. This cultural difference would go on to become more apparent during the golden age of arcades starting in the mid 70s. Fast forward to the 1980s and the gaming industry experienced its second consumer boom with the introduction of battle simulators or what we call today shooters. Battlezone, Missile Commander, Defender, and Galaga were instant smash hits at arcades across the US. Meanwhile, 
Japan after the success of Space Invader, took a different approach to video game themes with the release of Pac-Man, a cute game that features eating things rather than killing things, which Japanese developers back then thought had a broader gender and market appeal than shooters, which during that era was more heavily associated with men. Within a year of its release, Pac-Man went on to become the highest grossing gaming franchise, even outperforming Star Wars in revenue. However, that wouldn't last very long. In 1985, Nintendo, after single-handedly saving the American video games market with the releases of Donkey Kong and Duck Hunt, incredibly accurate zapper and play games like Duck Hunt and Hogan's Alley, would go on to release the second most iconic video game in history for Nintendo, Super Mario Brothers. With its colorful array of game design choices, power-ups, side-scroller platforming, and unique identity paired with in-game narrative, took a slumping video game market in the US back into an upward trend. At this point, you have to be wondering what this history lesson in video games innovations has to do with the gender divide within Pokemon. So let's tie this back towards our earlier findings with this interview I had with a gaming industry colleague I worked with, whom worked in the industry during this coming of age era in gaming. And it was really Nintendo who understood that, hey, you know, it's women who are playing these games, women who are interested in the games, women who are making purchase decisions about the console because they wanted to have something that their family could play together, right? And, um, and that started to bring a lot of women in. So, and if you were a girl in, you know, if, if you had grown up in the 80s and had confronting video games in the mid 90s, um, they weren't for you, right? It's just, they were never marketed to you. They, they weren't, the themes weren't, didn't include you, right? They, they weren't, you know, for you as, as, as a typical woman. But in, by the early 2000s, I think that had changed, you know, and people were making games that were specifically targeted to be more inclusive and, and uh, or, or, or targeting women in particular. Here, I asked John why he thinks, despite Pokemon being about cute, vibrant creatures and collecting things, somehow the game ended up having a predominantly male-oriented player base. Well, there is there is fighting and conflict, and I can I can see where that might have been seen to skew more masculine. And it is competitive, right? It's something that you sit down and compete with, and that's really how Pokemon caught on in the U.S. I think, um, uh, especially on the card side, more so than um, maybe in Japan. And it's possible that. The Japanese were stressing more the collection aspect, whereas the the Americans are stressing more the combat aspect. But honestly, I mean, I just think that the uh, uh, it was the demographics of of the audience that the marketing followed, rather than vice versa. You know what I mean? I don't think marketing was sitting back and saying, "Hey, you know, how can we sell this to more women?" They were just thinking, "Hey, we've you know, boys like this sort of thing. Let's sell it to boys, right?" And it wasn't until they realized the market could be expanded over the course of years and seeing more female players come into it that they started to market more to females or just more inclusively at all. The 80s and 90s of video games were seasoned by male game developers who grew up during a time of conflict as their cultural background. This shaped many of the narratives within games as well as the marketing messages during that time. By this point, gaming in the West had become cemented predominantly as male entertainment arcades and home consoles were constantly showcased alongside men. Not only this, but these games were also being developed by the same men who were marketing to other men and boys. Looking back at the marketing during this time, it's quite apparent who the target demographic was. The main takeaway from this point in gaming history is that, seemingly, gender neutral design choices like Pac-Man went with marketing towards both men and women would be the key ingredients to commercial success and longevity for Pokemon. A lesson in the United States gaming industry would take several decades to learn. Pokemania. So back to the Pokemon timeline with this lens on the gaming history trip we took to get here. The success of Red and Blue for Pokemon has Nintendo of America sitting pretty cushy riding off the back of its success. However, this wouldn't last for very long. With the worldwide phenomenon of Pokemania full swing, Nintendo and Game Freak were quick to follow up with their sequel, Gold, Silver, and Crystal. Despite it improving on the monster collector formula, Master Fleet, the franchise would not be able to top their initial success from Red and Blue. This was the beginning of the downslope in regards to Pokemon's relevancy in the US. Part of this downtrend may be attributed to the US's old habit of segmenting their customer base from their preconceived notion that video games were for boys. An argument could be made that between the marketing towards a fragmented consumer base and Nintendo's decision to brand their handheld device as Game Boy, only from Nintendo, ultimately put them in a position where growth and expanding their market share became stunted. And, and eventually Nintendo of America, would learn in the later years. With the release of Ruby and Sapphire, Nintendo of America decided to take a page out of Nintendo of Japan's marketing book 
and try appealing to a wider audience with their all-inclusive campaign featuring various age groups, backgrounds, and genders. Pokemon Sapphire, solo para Game Boy Advance, clasificado E para todos. This may have been due to the poor reception of their first commercial that prominently featured boys adventuring in caves. With sales possibly being lower than anticipated, my educated guess would be that the marketing department of Nintendo of America were pressured by Nintendo headquarters to rectify the issue and expand their marketing appeal to wider audiences. However, the damage had already been done. Pokemon, like many other games in the US at this time, were firmly cemented as a boys game. My anecdotal research, while limited in scope, revealed that many girls during this period in Pokemon gaming oftentimes were met with immense alienation, not only from peers at school, but even family members. Hey Barbie. Yeah, honey. Aren't you excited? Well, I was hoping to get a- PlayStation 5? Oh my God. I can't believe it. Well, we know how badly you wanted it. Dang, I can't even imagine. Not to mention the already well-established practice of gatekeeping that occurred amongst boys. See, Paul, you don't have to worry. I'll keep up the town tradition. Oh, no girls allowed. You know that. Now go in the house and cook dinner. I'm hungry. Ooh. This was even highlighted in commercials in the US. The Pokemon trading card game for Game Boy Color depicts older boys gatekeeping the trading card game. Hey, you Pikachu although not as direct, also incorporated messaging that you had to already know about Pokemon to be good at the game, when the commercial's main protagonist's sister comes over and inquires about the game. almost 200 words. My sister knows like 12. Yeah. Pikachu, this way. See, unlike my sister, a direct response. The irony of this hindsight is that it appears executives and writers at Nintendo of America already were aware of these adolescent interactions, and decided to accept it as a normal cultural occurrence, when in fact this acceptance of the gender bias and gatekeeping would be their Achilles heel in the later years of Pokemon's decline in the early 2000s. Pikachu only does what he wants. How do you know he's a he? Maybe Pikachu's a she. Whatever, can I play? After the sharp decline in sales following gold and silver that sold 34 million copies, with the release of Ruby and Sapphire selling 24 million copies, things at Nintendo of America were starting to look pretty grim. I can only imagine how much pressure the marketing department must have faced when trying to explain why they were short 10 million copies in sales. With this in mind, it seems that Nintendo America needed to take a different approach to their marketing tactics if they were to remain relevant in the gaming space. Shadow Realm of Relevancy With this chapter closed on the third generation came the release of a new console entirely. The release of the Nintendo DS and Pokemon Diamond and Pearl marked a new era not only for the branding of the Nintendo handheld console but also for the franchise as a whole in America. Their flagship commercial placed a new emphasis on broader gender appeal by featuring boys and girls, as well as a more simplified message around gameplay for the later half of the commercial. With over 100 new Pokemon in Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl, they're gonna be everywhere. Ready to catch, battle, and trade. Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Pearl, gotta catch them all. Only for that, Nintendo. paired with moving away from the Game Boy naming scheme that the legacy consoles carried, allowed for Nintendo to start a new chapter in creating a more welcoming message to potential gamers and a wider audience. Although this new approach was indeed a good step in the right direction, Pokemon in the US had a long journey ahead of them to repair the image that was hardwired into the franchise from the late 90s and early 2000s. Between 2006 and 2008, Diamond and Pearl sold 2 million more copies than they had the previous year with Ruby and Sapphire. After reviewing the various commercials at that time, there seemed to be a clear emphasis on incorporating both boys and girls within their commercials. This effort seemingly had a positive impact on sales figures, not only for their mainline titles, but also their spin-off games. 
one of which prominently featured a girl as one of the lead protagonists in their Mystery Dungeon commercial. I am Pikachu. I am Mudkip. I am Chimchar. You can team up, battle, and explore with over 490 Pokemon in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Time and Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Darkness, rated E for everyone. Discover your inner Pokemon. Great choice, Nintendo US. Great choice. So, finally, Nintendo America is learning from their past mistakes and seems to be moving in the right direction. Unbeknownst to them, a looming market crash in the US was just around the corner that would slow market growth to a screeching halt in the upcoming years, taking their newfound efforts and direction into an inevitable moot point for the franchise. Bro, nobody cares. Don't get me wrong, this was the worst year for Pokemon sales in history. Black and white, selling 2 million less copies than the previous release, and even half a mil less than Ruby and Sapphire. You bet Lord Nintendo was not happy about that one. I think this result is in part due to their new efforts to reach a broader audience, which canceled out the lower sales numbers by the market of males they were targeting previously. An interesting note here is that their commercials during this period also shifted from higher budget narrative pieces to strictly gameplay. A region like no other. A place where the seasons change. I'm not sure if this was part due to marketing budgets being cut in the face of declining sales expectations, or the marketing team taking a new approach to messaging, but based on my experience in the game's marketing industry, I would guess that the former seems more probable. Commercials for X and Y, Sun and Moon, as well as Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire went back to featuring real people from 2013 through 2016. Despite how impressive these commercials were for Pokemon, it had some of the lowest sales figures for the franchise, barely topping over Ruby and Sapphire sales. There was a shining diamond in the rough for this situation though, and that came in the form of Pokemon Go in 2014. Now, seeing as I was not directly involved with the production of these titles, I'm going to try and extrapolate why these numbers were so low for the franchise, despite now being in an economy that was out of recession and flourishing. The Pokemon company in my eyes were taking great strides in the US to reach a wider audience rather than just the boys. However, this image and idea that the game really didn't appeal to girls and women was still looming over the heads of American culture. Makahita, Wilmer. What's happening, Pikachu? Go, touch grass. So before we shift over to the transitional period for Pokemon, it's important to see the ramp up as well as the desperation for Nintendo to change its cultural perception in the West. Things were okay. The bleeding of relevancy had stopped, but that's as far as it would go. Nintendo knew it needed to innovate if they were to maintain their cultural relevancy globally. That brings us to the X and Y era. In a desperate attempt to bring back audiences from the Pokemania era, they introduced Mega Evolutions. In Pokemon X and Y, they can evolve even more with Mega Evolutions. What? Mega Venusaur. Mega Charizard, and Mega Blastoise. Yeah! As well as rebooting the original 151 cards with a reprint spin called XY Evolutions. Power up for a new generation in Pokemon trading card game XY Evolutions. In stores now. Each booster pack of 10 cards holds 70 cards very by pack. I won't go too deeply into this, but trust me, they were on the ropes sales-wise despite their new inclusive campaign. From a marketing standpoint, I think this was despite not knowing about the imminent arrival of Pokemon Go at the time, a Hail Mary to keep old and new players interested in the franchise, while more resources were being allocated to the development of Pokemon Go. Looking at the sales figures for X and Y in 2013, the year before Pokemon Go was released, as well as the absence of a follow-up release to X and Y in 2014 and 2015, it becomes apparent that Pokemon was placing a lot of hope and resources into Pokemon Go for mobile to restore its brand image that the US cannibalized many years ago onto itself. Now, Pokemon Go, in my opinion, was a fresh start for the franchise to reset the idea of who Pokemon was meant for. Their commercials for Pokemon Go were peak in terms of wide consumer appeal, showcasing various age groups, nationalities, and both men and women. However, this came at quite a production cost for the franchise. I suspect in order to maintain integrity within this new endeavor developed by Niantic, the Pokemon company had to reallocate resources to make sure this project didn't fall flat on its face. 
That brings us to 2016 with the release of Sun and Moon. On the backs of Pokemon Go craze, now into its second year of development, at this point, Nintendo resorted to appealing to the now maturing audience that originally played Red and Blue by incorporating nostalgia to promote Sun and Moon. The result? An upwards trend. Finally, Nintendo of America and the Pokemon Company could take a sigh of relief. The declining sales figures seemed to finally come to an end. Pokemon's image was turning around with Pokemon Go. As a matter of fact, women outplayed men 63% to 37% according to Forbes in 2016. They finally did it. Pokemon was able to crack the patriarchy that was established by the era of Red and Blue. Not only that, but the company doubled down with the success with the release of spin-off games. Let's go Pikachu and Eevee. where you could bring over Pokemon from Go to your console game. An absolute brilliant idea, enticing more of the majority of players who are women to play the mainline games additionally. This feature would pay off immensely for the next generation of Pokemon games in 2019. This couldn't have come at a better time for them, as there was an impending global crisis waiting for them just around the corner. The Pokedemic. Introducing Pokemon Sword and Shield for the new released Switch. Having sold 60 million copies within the first six weeks of release, surpassing Sun and Moon's total lifetime sales overnight, things were looking great for the company. Until March 2020. The world comes to a halt. The U.S. goes into a lockdown due to the pandemic. Stores close up. Mask mandates are issued. In the meantime, people start playing video games like never before. Video gamers are seeing a rise in participants amid the pandemic. With what's going on, oh, no. what better than to immerse yourself in another world? According to Nielsen, 46% more of Americans playing video games since March of 2020. There's a lot of time spent inside, so there's a lot of flexibility in how you can game. And people are willing to splurge because they're spending that time at home. You know, perhaps this is their vacation money that they would normally go to a crowded beach or something like that. And with the timing of it and the short supply creates a demand also. Sword and Shield sold another 10 million copies during the lockdown, making it the third highest grossing Pokemon game of all time. With production of Pokemon cards also coming to an absolute crawl, demand for their products skyrocketed due to low supply levels coming from printing shortages. The cards they need to play, and in some cases even fighting over <laughs> these valuable cards. Why? It was 1998 all over again, baby, and Pokemon Mania was at its all-time high. Walmart and Target have actually had to stop selling these because people were making a mess in the store and even getting violent. And those weren't kids, those were adults. There was even a man who pulled a gun on another customer just to get Pokemon cards. And you Retailers had to hire security whenever there was new stock of cards in store, since the neckbeards and scalpers were feuding over the limited supply. The masses craved shiny cardboard and an outlet to spend their stimmy checks on. Players were picking up Pokemon Go again due to their cabin fever, and Logan Paul was crashing in on the wave of new and returning Pokemon fans. Nintendo of America and the Pokemon Company had to issue workers color blindness warnings from all the green charts they were witnessing on every front. After 20 years, they were out of the slumps, and becoming not only relevant, but damn near a new cultural phenomenon once again. Cards appreciated to new all-time highs, and have maintained market share at twice its baseline interest, according to Google Trends. So where does that leave us now? Are women still relegated to enjoying Pokemon in secret from the comfort of their own homes? Fast forward and we're a couple years out of lockdown. Pokemon in the US has been working diligently to change their brand image in the US for the last 11 years. Pokemon Go's campaign 
brought new and longtime female fans to the table for the entire hobby. Seems like things are going great, right? Well, almost. There's still one safe haven for male toxicity, gatekeeping, and no girls allowed mentality. It's been the slowest changing aspect of Pokemon and the longest standing boys club since its inception in the 90s, the Pokemon trading card game. Oh yeah, shiny cardboard. My wallet's favorite thing. Unlike its counterparts, which can be enjoyed alone, the TCG has a core aspect built in that requires peer-to-peer -peer socialization. This, unlike its cousins, have various ways to enjoy this aspect of the hobby. There are collectors as well as players, which means although the trading card game does at its core require a competitive nature that's built in the product, as a collector myself, I do want to include a touch of anecdotal experience that generally speaking relates to many other players' experiences. In September of 2023, I surprisingly found myself at a Power Rangers convention. I came across a table of Pokemon cards. Within a month, I had spent several paychecks worth in sealed and singles. No regrets. I eventually was invited to come to the local Friday night TCG event where locals would come and battle it out for a top placement prize. It was a great turnout of nothing but dudes. 40 year olds, 30 year olds, 20s and even tweens. Now, this wasn't the first time I had experienced very similar sausage parties in the past. It wasn't until I began researching the subject that I realized this was a systemic issue rooted in the very foundation of the franchise. The single remaining frontier where the boys only mentality still persists. Keep in mind, this issue isn't reflective of the entire male presenting inhabitants of the hobby, but the image, experiences, and homogenous mentality are real, unfortunately. While researching this topic, I came across an article that inspired hope for this corner of the hobby. Girl Power TCG, a collective of femme presenting competitive Pokemon card players, houses dozens of players who have experienced similar experiences in various regions in and out of the US. Their stories all more or less experience the same gatekeeping narrative beats. However, if math has taught me anything before failing at it in college, there's power in numbers. Having an organization supporting femmes in male dominated spaces is but the first step into making the entire Pokemon franchise an inclusive space. Although this in the grand scheme of things isn't enough to make a cultural impact to the point where your average femme Pokemon fan would feel welcomed in such spaces. No, it requires a grassroots internal effort on Pokemon's part, if lasting change is to be made. Falling to the same legacy issues of Red and Blue, it wasn't until 2022 that Pokemon realized that if they were going to continue growing and not fall flat on their face, they would need to attract new types of audiences. Introducing Pokemon Go card set. While this wasn't the most successful step for the company, it did come with a nice commercial featuring girls more predominantly than ever before. The team up you've been waiting for, the Pokemon trading card game, Pokemon Go expansion. Keep in mind that over the last decade, Pokemon has been shifting towards a graphics only approach to their card game commercials by and large. I think this approach removes any association with who the game is for by focusing on the attractive aspects of the game. However, on occasion for large announcements, they have been pretty good about incorporating a wide variety of cast in their messaging. Take for example, the launch video for Pokemon Scarlet and Violet TCG. Here you can start to see a trend where after a prolonged period of ignoring the inherent man keeping, Pokemon learns from their mistakes and adopts the Japanese model of inclusivity in marketing. However, I have my doubts that relying upon the Go community to infiltrate the TCG and make it a more welcoming space will bear change on a scale this comprehensive of an issue. Pokemon will need to innovate once again if they are wanting to move past this chapter in the franchise. What that looks like is still anyone's guess. I think Pokemon has a great future ahead of them, and I believe they are moving in a direction that's more inclusive for everyone. Even if there are some places in the hobby that leaves more to be desired, the steps and strides they've taken thus far has me hopeful. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video through, and I hope it was insightful. If you'd like to support the channel and see more content in the future, consider checking out my website that carries Pokemon cards and various unique items we've curated from Japan and Korea. If you're bored doom scrolling TikTok, I also stream card openings there at the time of this video being made. Links are down in the description. Cheers, and stop gatekeeping, lads.